Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this Meeting Minds session. Uh, I'm Rebecca Baxter. I'm Development Director at Kellogg College. And before we start, there's just a little bit of housekeeping to go through. Um, we'd be really grateful if you could keep your microphones muted uh, during the discussion just to avoid any background noise. Um, there will be time to ask questions during the session, and you can raise a digital hand or put any questions in the chat box, which is being covered by my colleague Shabazz and me. And finally, we're recording today's session. Uh, so please feel free to have your video on if you like. You'll only actually be visible if you decide to speak. Uh, so I'm really delighted uh, to welcome you to the session with speakers from Kellogg's own Global Centre on Healthcare and Urbanisation, which launched in September 2019. You'll be hearing from two of our research fellows, Dr. Georgia Richards and Dr. Juliet Carpenter. But before that, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. David Howard, one of the centre's co-directors, who will introduce this session properly. Over to you, David. Hello, thanks very much, Rebecca. Thanks everyone else for joining us today. Um, we have about 30 minutes to tell you about the work of the, uh, the new center on uh, Global uh, Center on Healthcare and Urbanization. And uh, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Georgia, Juliet and Carl um, and, and Robert, our administrator, uh, who will be leading us through uh, a discussion of what we're doing. The center was set up in September 2019, and it came about as a result of really a recognition that there was a concentration of students and researchers and fellows uh, engage in two specific fields within Kellogg. Uh, one is sustainable urban development, the other one is the evidence-based healthcare program, which uh, many of you know has been running and leading the field of evidence-based healthcare for the last 25 years, uh, over 25 years. So we brought the two sort of strengths together, research strengths together, and the centre was founded uh, in, in 20, September 2019. Um, and the idea was to look at the connection between uh, sustainable urban design and health prevention and health care. Now, um, you'll then notice that actually in January or December 2019, January 2021, the pandemic started. So in some ways it was uh, unfortunate uh, timing for the centre, but it meant that we had a lot to, to uh, work on, to research and discuss. So one of the key aspects of the um, research we've been doing is looking at a link between how can we create sustainable cities, uh, how, how can we create healthy cities, healthy cities in terms of the population and also the urban design, looking at the social, uh, the political, economic and environmental impact and influences of cities. So I think there's the next slide uh, coming along um, soon. No. Uh, well, anyway, the uh, there we are. That's so that's us, um, uh, the centre members. Uh, one of the key uh, parts of our work we've been doing uh, over the last year is uh, setting up a commission uh, on creating healthy cities. Now, this is uh, been launched in 2020. It was a program we discussed about pre-pandemic, so it's not a case that we were uh, looking at a particular impact of the COVID pandemic upon urban living, but clearly this became a key aspect of our interests. So the commission is set up, as I said, in December 2020. It's chaired by Lord Best. There are um, commissioners who meet uh, every uh, month or so to discuss uh, input on how we can build healthier cities, looking, as I said, at environmental, economic, social, and political uh, aspects of a healthy city, city design and also retrofitting. Uh, there's an international advisory board chaired by Lord Crisps and the aim is, as I mentioned, to explore the links between urban development and the risks to health and well-being, uh, but also looking at how the social prescribing, how healthy design can also create healthy uh, population and residents. Um, Lord uh, Best has uh, chaired a video as well, which we're going to show next. We'll give you a uh, brief introduction to the work of the Commission in far more coherent and fluent manner than I can. So I will um, leave you to watch the video and then uh, Juliet Carpenter, one of our research fellows, will take on the baton and lead you through the rest of the talk. Over the last hundred years or so, the art of placemaking, which is the underpinning of community and the foundation of civic life has been deliberately abandoned and, and forgotten. The forces of rapid urbanization, climate change and natural resource depletion are so great 
that now is the time for different professions to combine together with a clear focus and determination to help solve these critical issues which will impact on the lives of millions of people for generations to come. I'm Richard Best, I'm an independent in the House of Lords and I have the honour of chairing the Commission on Creating Healthy Cities. We've brought together leading academics like Professors Rachel Cooper and Yolanda Barnes, leading business people like uh, Lord Karen Billy Moria, the President of the CBI, and uh, city leaders like Marvin Rees, the, the Mayor of Bristol. And we're exploring the links between health and well-being and uh, urban design, planning, action from transport and infrastructure to housing and the built environment. I'm Marvin Rees, the Mayor of Bristol, and I'm a member of Commission Subgroup C, which focuses on health and well-being. And we see the reality of this challenge every day in the city's life. Air quality related to around 300 deaths every year in the city. Homes, are they warm? Um, do they provide access to a community so that people are not socially isolated uh, in the city as well? A lot of people have to choose between eating and eating and other household expenses. And we know the relationship also with green spaces and mental health, something that's become increasingly apparent during the COVID pandemic. Health is not just about the National Health Service. Most of our health outcomes and conditions are created by social conditions. So it means that we need the information, the data, the evidence to be able to move upstream, to, to support best practice in city leaders uh, all across the UK, but certainly you know, around the world. My name is Rachel Cooper. I'm Professor of Design Management and Policy at Lancaster University. And it's my pleasure to be on the Commission for Creating Healthy Cities and to chair the subgroup for the built environment, design and placemaking. I've been undertaking research on the effect of the urban environment on our health and well-being for over 20 years. And I recognise the aspects of the city that affect our health are complex and multifactorial. The design of our homes, of our streets, of the transport we use all have an impact throughout our life. On the air we breathe, on the way we move around, on the social interaction we gain and much more. That is why we must address the challenge of creating healthy cities in a holistic way. Indeed, interdisciplinary and inclusive approaches are needed to address the increasing challenges of creating healthy cities to ensure that they can be implemented, managed and maintained effectively for this and future generations. The Commission's call for evidence is inviting all interested parties to send us evidence on, on what works in creating healthy cities. We, we want to hear from uh, academics, for sure, but also from practitioners and individual citizens. We've set out a whole load of, uh, of questions. Feel free to answer any or one of them, or indeed to bring us other thoughts in our mission to find the best ways of creating healthy cities. Thank you. So good afternoon, I'm Georgia Richards, one of the research fellows at the Global Centre on Healthcare and Urbanisation. And the first task that um, we're doing as part of the Commission is a systematic scoping review to find out what 
published academic literature um, tells us about what creates healthy cities. So we've searched four different academic databases um, from medical related databases to um, geography related databases, and we've identified um, nearly 800 different reviews, um, literature reviews, systematic reviews, um, and we've screened all of these reviews to look to see um, what type of interventions or exposures are from green spaces to environmental interventions, as well as finance and economics and governance, uh, to see what um, of these interventions and um, how they can improve the health and well-being of cities. Um, so far, we've included just over 300 different reviews, um, and we're going through the process now of extracting data um, and synthesizing all of this evidence uh, from the academic literature. But we're also screening and searching the grey literature. So we're looking at the WHO, um, the World Bank and various other organizations to see what reports have been done um, in this space. I'll hand over to Juliet. Thanks. Thanks so much, Georgia. Um, so my name is Juliette Carpenter. I'm a research fellow at GCHU as well. Um, and I'm just going to outline a little bit more about the call for evidence that Lord Bess was talking about. So it's currently open um, until next week, until next Monday, the 20th of September. Um, and what the Commission is hoping to do is to gather evidence on four broad themes just outlined here. Um, firstly, around the built environment, urban design and placemaking. This covers areas such as housing, urban planning, design, regeneration. Secondly, around transport and mobility, infrastructure and technology. And this very much touches on smart cities and how smart cities and technology can um, assist in, in contributing to creating healthy cities. And thirdly, we're looking at health and well-being, and this includes public health, issues around social prescribing, urban agriculture, um, exercise, and, and issues related to, to well-being more generally. And then fourthly, we have a cross-cutting theme, like an umbrella theme, if you like, um, around governance and decision-making processes. In particular, thinking about how citizens can get more involved in decision-making and governance of our cities, contributing to healthy cities more generally. And the Commission welcomes responses both from academic institutions, from local government, from the third sector, and more generally from citizens, from the general public, um, to hear about what works from their perspective on creating healthy cities. And the link there shows how people can um, submit evidence. So if you or your organisations um, have any evidence that might be relevant to the Commission, we'd love to hear from you. And so just to outline some of the next steps in the research that we're doing, um, there are some ongoing expert discussions where we're gathering evidence and information from, for example, the um, Public Health England, from the Healthy Cities Network, which has been run by the WHO for some years now. And then to complement that, we're also running some city pilots starting this month. And what we're hoping to do is to get some user feedback on the pilot website that we're going to be developing, um, what we're calling at the moment a Healthy Cities Toolkit, where we're going to gather the evidence related to creating healthy cities that's going to have relevance for city leaders and decision makers. And we're piloting that in the three cities of Nottingham, Bristol, and the London Borough of Brent. And then a bit further down the line, towards the end of the year, we're going to be running some thematic focus groups with some key stakeholders key actors, both at the city level, within city regions, national level agencies, so some key actors um, to find out what they think about the emerging recommendations that's coming from the evidence and how that might be relevant for them. Um, so it's really embedding the outcomes from the commission within the user group um, themselves. And in terms of the outputs, We'll be having a final report towards the end of next summer. Um, we're going to be um, producing a Healthy Cities Toolkit, which is a web-based, um, evidence-based toolkit for city leaders and um, the general public to access the evidence that we've found in terms of what works for healthy cities. We're building new partnerships and collaborations, and there'll also be a number of academic publications from the Scoping Review and the focus groups. Um, which detail the, the results and the findings. 
And then very much the follow up to this work in terms of GCHU's work is to do some research to build upon those findings, to fill in the gaps in the evidence that we found on what makes a healthy city. And so that's going to be the agenda for GCHU going forward. So I'm going to say a little bit more about um, GCHU's public engagement remit. Um, one, of, one of the remits of the centre is to reach out to the public to engage with public debates. And we run a seminar series twice termly um, where we engage with, with um, the public through um, a seminar series where we invite four short interventions from experts on a leading um, topical issue. And for example, in week one, we're going to be having a public seminar on low traffic neighborhoods. Anyone um, on the call here who's, who's based in or near Oxford will be welcome to come along. Um, low traffic neighborhoods, as some of you may know, are quite a hot topic here in Oxford at the moment, um, with a number of them having been implemented in recent months. Um, so we're going to be debating that with academic experts, with activists, and with the public as well. Um, and then in week eight, um, we'll be uh, doing a seminar, um, public seminar series on cycling safety. So again, um, everyone's welcome to come along to that. Um, and next, uh, Georgia, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Juliet. So another program of research that GCHU is involved in and developing is um, around uh, preventable deaths in England and Wales. So um, we have created an online database and an online platform that um, nicely collates all of the um, prevention of future death reports um, in England and Wales. And we've worked with a number of students on various projects, which I'll summarize briefly. Next slide, please, Delia. So the, we had a student, um, a micro intern, come and work with us back in the summer, and his task was to look at um, preventable deaths involving cyclists. Um, so this report is available online on the GCHU website, and um, what we found when we looked at all the different um, prevention of future death reports is that 33 were related to cyclists, um, and most of these deaths occurred in London, uh, but there was wide variation across England and Wales. Um, we identified six major concerns. Um, most of these concerns were um, relating to cycle lanes. Um, and the conclusions of the report shows that if we could improve the infrastructure, as well as information and regulations, um, these deaths could be prevented. Next slide. Another um, student um, was looking at preventable deaths in cities. So we've had several students working on different cities. Um, the most recent one looked at um, the city of Oxford and, and the surroundings of Oxford. Um, so here we identified 22 different um, types of preventable deaths in Oxford. And the median age of these uh, preventable deaths were 55, which was actually significantly um, older than the other preventable deaths that we saw in Cambridge and Nottingham. And most of these deaths involved males. Um, three major concerns em emerged. These were related to suicides by first time prison prisoners, um, a lack of healthcare resources, and poor communication in emergency services. The maps display the variation or the, I, the points where these deaths occurred as well. And then finally, we had another student um, who was looking at preventable deaths during the COVID 19 pandemic. Here we found uh, 20, 23 preventable deaths involving um, SARS CoV 2. And this was between um, January of 2020 and June of 2021. But there again was quite large geographical variation um, with some areas like Wales and the southwest of England and East Midlands reporting no preventable deaths. Whereas in the northwest of England, we had the most deaths, um, preventable deaths reported. We found in total 56 different types of concerns that were raised by the coroners in these reports, um, with the most common being around communication, as well as around um, the fa a failure to follow protocols. And this um, studies um, up online as a preprint, um, so anyone can get online and have a look at um, the whole report. So I'm just going to report a, a bit about the more qualitative research that we've been undertaking, in particular looking at community responses to the COVID pandemic and how the community mobilisation, um, the lessons from that can feed into thinking more holistically and in a more integrated way about health and the provision of health through integrated care systems, um, the NHS's um, 
new way of organizing health and social care. Um, and so the qualitative research um, illustrated that the mobilization, community mobilization, had a significant impact on um, the health and well being of more vulnerable um, members of the community through the community networks and the voluntary and community sector um, Im implementation within the city. And what we identified were the critical links between um, the voluntary and community sectors and the potential for a more integrated approach to health um, within the community. And we also identified the important role of social prescribing and community link workers in bridging the gaps between health and community provision for health and uh, health and well-being within the community. Um, and so that's some of the qu more qualitative research that we've been doing um, at, at GCHU. And again, going back to public engagement, um, some work that we're going to be undertaking um, shortly through into the new year is partnering with the Science Together program at Oxford University, which is part of the public engagement research program at the university. And what they're doing is piloting an innovative approach to engaging with local communities within Oxford. Um, quite often, academics think of a, an idea that they want to implement, that they think is important for a community. Whereas this turns that idea on its head um, and thinks from the perspective of, of the communities, what actually do communities want, what kind of research would be, would be useful for them, and actually going to community groups and asking them to put forward research ideas um, that would then link with the skills of researchers within the university. So GCHU are taking part in this innovative um, pilot scheme, um, which is very much community-led, um, organically defining, defining the research questions led by the communities themselves. Um, and that starts this month and goes on into the new year. And we're very excited to be involved in that as well. So another aspect that GCHU is really um, keen to, to build is um, our involvement with the students, um, both at Kellogg, the Kellogg community, as well as more broadly across Oxford. Um, so we've undertaken, we've, we've had um, six different micro internships that have um, come on board over the last few months. And these students have um, come from various backgrounds. So we've had quite a diverse group um, from health related subjects, as well as policy um, and geography. So it's been fantastic to, um, to get the students on board. We building capacity and teaching and training the next generation is something GCHU is um, really passionate about. So we've had a fantastic time with the students and they've all produced um, extremely impressive outputs um, and they, they've done a fantastic job. So this is something that GCHU will continue to do um, over the, as we, as we decide, as we continue to, to build and grow. So to finish, I'd like to say if you have social media, um, do follow us. Um, we're a fairly new account, but we plan to, to build ourselves. So please do follow us and the work that we're doing. You can also go onto um, our website, gchu.org.uk to sign up to our mailing list and any and all the updates when we publish reports or publications, they'll all go on that website, as well as um, commission related um, aspects. So you can go on and see what's happening with the commission. And you can also get in touch with us via email. Um, but to finish, we'd like to acknowledge and thank our um, funders, the McCormick Bain Foundation and the Princess Foundation, and we'll open the floor and happy to take any questions um, from participants. So thank you for listening. I'll now also welcome my colleague, Carl Hennigan, to um, introduce himself as well. Thanks, Georgia. Really uh, fascinating uh presentation and Julia I really enjoyed the video one question I'd like to just start and just to say to everybody my name's Carl Hennigan I'm professor of evidence-based medicine at the University of Oxford and director of the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine I was really interested in the concept of how do individuals or members of the public what type of evidence may be useful it was pretty quick I understand how we can find the research evidence but what type of evidence would be most useful for the public to submit to the commission and you, I don't mean to stun you into silence either Georgia or Juliet there or David might be able to answer on that one yeah certainly I'll jump in there um, so the commission have defined um, a, a quite a long list of particular questions 
they're interested un under those four headings. And I think it, it's fascinating to look through from rather than from my sort of researcher's perspective, but actually as a citizen, um, I've got my own thoughts about the responses that I might give as a, as a citizen um, living day to day in a city, be it around um, sort of traffic and, and cycling or um, access to sort of health services or um, indeed around that cross-cutting um, area of governance and decision making and the issues around um, participatory democracy as opposed to representative democracy and how I feel that my voice can best be heard. And I think a lot of these questions will have resonance um, for citizens um, of, of cities and, and more broadly. Um, and I think um, it would be interesting to, to access the views of, of a wider public, not just um, academics or, or um, local government. Um, and so anyone in, on the call interested in exploring some of the questions that the Commission are interested in, please do click on that link. And I think Robert has put it in the chat. Um, so do click on the link and see, um, see what your responses are to, to some of these day-to-day um, -day questions that I think affect absolutely everyone. And so, you know, please do, do take part. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. I don't know if anyone else has got anything to say. Yeah, I'll just jump in and just say thank you so much, colleagues, for that fantastic presentation. And I am just going to reiterate um, the call to the audience to um, switch their videos on if they feel comfortable uh, to do so. And, and please do feel free to raise your digital hand or put a question in the chat box. Um, I have a question, if I may. Um, but it's very much UK focused. And I was just struck by what David said right at the very beginning about the commission. And obviously the commission, the thoughts of the commission were already uh, sort of forming before the whole pandemic struck. Um, and I know that that now is, is something that's going to be taken into account, but something that I think, especially anyone who's UK based will have read about um, over these last uh, challenging few months is about actually the escape, the escape to the country from the city. And whether, I mean, again, obviously this is only from the UK perspective, so I'd be interested to hear if we've got anybody out there living somewhere else, but um, over here, of course, we've, we've heard all about um, people who are city-based desperate to sort of get out to the countryside so that they've got more green space. And I wonder how much do you think the pandemic will actually, will actually affect people's relationship with city living and how much it will affect the balance? I'm happy to start, start and answer. And <laughs> I'm not then, sure um, if that's a silly question, but it's just something no, that really struck all, not me. not at all. So, yeah. Uh, when the co when the pandemic sort of was was starting, um, I did some research um, with colleagues um, to try and look at responses too. So we did a sort of a literature review, and there were lots of anecdotal stories about how the pandemic would change uh, people. And I emphasise choice because many are constrained by by where they where they can live, and that notion of that uh, you know that increase in rural living and the reduced day-to-day -day, uh, need to be in the office, et cetera. I think one of the key aspects of the centre is we focus on evidence-based research. So there are lots of, there's lots of anecdotes, there's lots of op-eds. Uh, and when we did the literature review, a lot of the stories about this, uh, you know, transition in where people are living were opinion pieces. So I think it will take a, a while until we get the evidence. So you, you, we might have one or two anecdotal stories. We might know colleagues or friends of friends who've made that decision or are able to make a decision. Because again, it's, a, it's in many ways it's an opportunity. You have to have that ability to, to move and also to fit around your employment or your current livelihood um, demands. So I think that's something that would be interesting to look at. I, I expect we, we really can't look at that with evidence until at least a few months down the line and probably over the next two years, because obviously moving house can take a long 
uh, be a long process, but I think there's definitely a mindset of change, and, I, and I don't, I'm sure many of the, our uh, audience um, amongst us here, uh, for those of you who have who've maybe uh, a been lucky enough to keep employment uh, during the pandemic, uh, but b are now facing the return to office. There's there's a uh, there's a different, uh, should we say, discussion in the air about how we can plan out our working routine, and there, I think there will be. In most case situations in offices, I'm sure the majority are saying, well, actually, yeah, I'm happy to go back to maybe a two or three day a week. And But there's also be those who do not want to go to the office and those who want to go in office all the time. So I think it takes a while for us to, A, for these changes uh, to be affected and then actually how to do the research and find the evidence to to, to work out what exactly mm -hmm. actually is happening. Yeah. I think Carl is uh, going yes, to Carl's hands raise up. a question <laughs> or uh, give the, the answer, I hope. <laughs> Um, I don't think there is an answer because first is it matters where you are in the world. So it's really important. But I think there are some really interesting differences between rural and urban areas. Urban areas tend to be younger populations and better off. So it depends on your health system. So if you have an insurance based system, you tend to do worse in rural areas because you're worse off and you can't afford the health system, the health insurance. There are some, though, in the UK, it tends to be the rural population's health is slightly better than the urban. And I think that's why we need to have the challenges of healthy cities to maximize their health gains going forward. Particularly, this is the global phenomenon of the transfer of people from rural areas to urbanization. And some countries like China have seen that in sort of like a tsunami in terms of the proportion of people have transferred over. In terms of infection, there's no doubt if you're in the rural areas, your risk of having an infection is much lower. And that's one of the interesting issues when people make comparisons of countries or areas. One of the key elements I always say is look at population density. So if you look at the population density of, of Norway, it's about one twentieth or about a tenth of that of the UK. If you compare Cornwall to London, much lower density of population. And if we compare somewhere like London to Sydney, completely different issue again. And, it, and the rates of coronavirus infection are much lower, therefore, in Cornwall. So I would say, actually, population density is one of the most important confounders to look for when you say people are comparing areas for infection rates. Now, it's interesting. You don't need an evidence based perspective to understand that, because actually this goes right back to the times of Henry VIII, who used to leave London and go traveling all around Oxfordshire, right up even to through places like up to Woodstock. And he stayed out of London for nearly two years when they had the plague and the sweating sickness because he was concerned about catching infections. Hundreds of years ago, we understood that better sometimes than what we do now. The key, I think, for cities is to understand the design that actually can maximise the density but minimise the impact of infections. And there are some simple measures that you might look at. So, for instance, the materials. And sometimes people will know if you go into a pub, sometimes you see materials like copper on the doors. So as you push and copper has a much better antiviral effect than stainless steel. So we can look at some of these issues when we think about minimizing the risks in cities. But also, I think Juliet alluded to it. The major bit about cities is the population effect. If you can change things simply, for instance, make us walk a bit more. You can have a huge impact on everybody's health by doing some simple things very well. And I'll, I'll I could carry on forever. <laughs> getting carried away, and I'll. Uh, no, no, we've got yeah. uh, that. That's that's fantastic. Thank you, Carl. I can see that we've got a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat. So if I may, I will just um, read out the question from uh, Mifanwe, if I may. Could the team say more about the investigation of how well-being and health are impacted by basic concerns about income and the area effects of concentrated low income or income inequality? Um, and the background to this is that Mifanwe used to work on the index of multiple deprivation at Oxford University. Um, and one domain was that was used in the index is income, a huge driver of other measures such as educational achievement. So, and 
says, if you had time, the question of the impact of gentrification on measures of well-being would also be fascinating to hear more about. Would any of the panel members like to speak to that point? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk a lot. IMDs and inequality are, are an incredibly important area. And I think thanks to Mifane for bringing that up. And, and I think what you're alluding to is that what we see wherever you are in the world, that deprivation and inequality increases mortality in those of lower socioeconomic status. And that trend in both males and females living in the most deprived areas, particularly in e England, has experienced a slowdown in, in improvements of mortality since 2011. So while mortality has been getting better for the population, those in the most deprived, it's not getting as better as quick. Now, this is an, an important issue because I'm often asked about, well, the economy, what, why does that matter? And actually it's incredibly important. Improving the economy can have a bigger impact in health than many other issues that we can find treatments for. One of the problems there, and this is an interesting issue about the, the link between areas of deprivation in the economy is the problem of migration. So if you invest in an area, one of the problems is the healthy people will tend to leave that area and migrate. And I am one of those people. There are probably others on this call. I used to live in North Manchester, which has the highest levels of deprivation in the country and one of the worst mortality rates, high smoking, high cancer, high alcohol intake, high mental health problems. The problem is by being mobile, the people who are healthy and education I take along with the economy will leave and migrate. And we see that wherever you go to areas of high economic activity. So often what you do when you invest in areas, you come back and you think we haven't changed the problem. And that's a really interesting issue because what happens is if you've got chronic disease, you've got comorbidities, you are unwell, you become immobile and in, you stay in those areas where you have deprivation. So you can see one of the problems is we've invested in areas and often the problem has not changed. But actually understanding these nuances is really interesting. I actually think our inequalities are also interesting. As the gap between the top and the bottom gets wider, we introduce more problems in healthcare and more problems in education and our well-being. So decreasing that is a really interesting issue in terms of impact on deprivation, but also impact on health. And so I'll just finish on one point. When I'm asked about things like restrictions, it is important to understand the impact on the economy, because if the economy gets worse off and our gross domestic product goes down, those at the bottom end will be worse off and their health will suffer as a consequence. So the economy is inextricably linked to our health and well-being. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, so we've got another, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. And I'm just just to say, um, James, I will come back to your question. Um, but I'm just going to go to Simon's question just because it, it kind of I think links to, to what we've just been talking about. And Simon's question is um, whether whether GCHU is actually liaising with the WHO Healthy City programme. Um, and Simon says that in Wales, um, they have a national integrated public health agency, which links with the local Healthy City programme, including, for example, Cardiff, which has been um, a designated WHO Healthy City for some years. Uh, no doubt there is ample scope for looking at best practice examples. Um, panel can can someone someone answer simon's question about our links with the who healthy cities program sure yes we've um of course we've been in touch with um their program I and mean, it's a as, as many will know it's a it's a very well established um, network of cities globally um set up in 1988 i understand um and so you know with a vast experience of you know, the challenges of creating healthy cities, um, but also some of the keys to unlocking that. Um, 
And so we've been in touch with the World Health Organization, with the network, um, and particularly with one of the key players in founding the Healthy Cities Network, um, Dr. Soros. Um, and so we had a long chat with him and are exploring the possibility of, of linking with them through a collaboration or a partnership. It's in the very early stages at the moment, but um, clearly um, take your point, Simon, that there are, you know, there are important lessons to be learned from their experience in Cardiff. And, and I understand um, Swansea as well as is designated or has recently designated a, a, a WHO healthy city as well. So, you know, and throughout the UK, there are a number of examples and more broadly, of course. So a lot of experience to draw on. And um, certainly we're, we're um, taking note of, of that and hopefully building some, some interesting partnerships as well in the future. Thank you, Juliet, that's great. So James, coming back to your question, James is just asking, how does the desire for healthy cities balance with the general buzz of, buzz of loud brash cities that can often make them exciting places to live? I don't know, James, do you want to say, do you want to say anything more about that? so that we can help kind of answer your question a bit more fully. I don't know if you're happy to do that. Yeah, I'm happy to say something. I, I Hi, think James. So, hello. Um, yeah, there are often, um, I guess, the more anecdotal surveys around the nicest and healthiest places to live. But I guess there's sometimes a perception that they can also be a bit, a bit boring um, in the nicest possible sense, and they can be clean and healthy and nice and um, be good for well-being, but actually not as exciting as some of the sort of London, New York, um, you know, type places that, you know, I guess don't have the same things. And I, and I think it's a really important conversation to make um, cities healthier, but I guess actually without losing the, the fun side of them, I guess that's where I was coming from. Okay, so how, how do we maintain that balance? So panel, what do we, what, what do we think about that? How, how can we maintain that, that balance between a city that is both healthy and, and yet still really vibrant and exciting? I, I, I'm going to come here. I say, James, the, the first thing that always comes to my mind when somebody asks such an excellent question is, I think, how old am I? And and at certain points in my lifetime, uh, an exciting brash city was right down my street. And I dropped my daughter off at Manchester University in Fallowfield. And about 30 years ago, I would have been, this is the place to live. And now I'm like, oh, get me out of here quick. But I think that's the important point, actually. I think you make an important point, James, is cities should be for everybody, shouldn't they? Whether you're 85 or you're 25 or you're five. And I think the diversity of what's required across the ages is it also goes to what do we mean by health? It's not the absence of disease. It's about our well-being. And that's not just about me being disease free, it might be about my social and cultural experience within a city. And I think the, the best examples would be cities that actually could sort of, for all the ages, provide something without affecting their well being. How you go around that is difficult because I know when you're a younger person, that's why the age the age structure of London is radically different to rural areas. It attracts young people. And as you get older, you want to move out to a slightly quieter part of the world. And I think, but particularly participation across the ages is crucial. And, and you know, and it, and it brings joy to everybody's heart when you see children playing in a playground in the middle, middle of a city centre, in the same way as you might see an 80 year old who can walk the streets because somebody's thought about the paving and what it means to be 80. So I think that is a great question and something we should be really mindful of. Can I, may I just throw something in? I know, I know I'm on the home team. Um, but uh, I used to live, um, I used to live in the Netherlands and um, I'm just really thinking about what you've said there, Carl, about cities being a great place to live, no matter, no matter what age you are. And I'm just thinking about what made it so great living in a city in the Netherlands. And it was the fact that people actually lived in the city centre. So their apartment living is just absolutely standard. Um, so therefore, so people, there's a, there's a culture of renting, um, 
people are living above the bars and cafes and shops uh, in those places. And it means that there's always a kind of life to the city, but that life um, is really made up of, um, you know, people of all ages. And I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's something that's very different from here. And I wonder if that is something that might, might make a difference to us here, you know, sort of proper city centre living. I don't know if that makes a difference. Maybe I'll come back to, sorry. sorry. No, go Carl, over to you. Well, I wanted to come back to Professor Simon Small's uh, question, actually, which I think is we found this same problem in healthcare. Is lots of people are doing good things and good work and good projects, but actually people keep reinventing the wheel because there's no registry and no place you can go and look up and say, right, what did they do in Cardiff? What did they try? And an actual description of the interventions is really helpful. And what was the impact? And if I replicate it here, is it possible to get the same results or do they differ? Now, I think that type of approach is something that needs to be connected together for us to learn the most from what works and particularly also what doesn't work. Because if you've got limited resources, you really don't want to be wasting your time with something that's going to take the next two to five years. And at the end of it, you go, oh, in Cardiff, they tried that and it didn't work. Thanks for letting us know five years in. So I think uh, Simon on the call, my, I think, is trying to create that network across maybe the UK and grow it would be really helpful of what is being tried, what the actual interventions and what's the impact would be really helpful. Well, thanks, David. I'll hand over. Yeah, no, no, I guess it's in terms of the, the change in urban planning. So you mentioned the difference between Netherlands and other countries. Well, um, planning laws have a key aspect. So um, there was a phase when you'd separate residential areas from industrial areas, from um, uh, you know, different zones. And, and if you look at sustainable urban design now, in, in many cases, looking at mixed land use and the rationale of that in terms of your healthy city is uh, some of you may have heard of the 15 minute city. And it's a notion that actually you can live in your urban neighborhood and be able to access most of the things you need in your life, whether it's a school, the work, the shop, um, a park, um, and be able to live within that zone. And what is interesting about 15 minute city and you can type it in and it's now a very popular term it used to, in some ways not long ago you'd be some sort of utopian dream well that would be lovely if I could just walk or use active travel to go to work to go to my school to shop etc uh, and that creates the buzz that i think james is talking about um but that 15 minute city has gone from an you know, almost a utopian idea into a policy measure and was one of the actually policies that uh and hidalgo the, the mayor of paris uh you know won her election on so re-elected um as a mayor of paris and in paris the notion of the 15 minute city is very much part and parcel of the active planning and that's bringing back mixed use neighborhoods um and Anne hidalgo, hidalgo so i just made her uh, announcement she was going to hope to be a, a candidate for the french presidential elections you never never know you might have 15 minute cities on the, on the national planning program in france um but i think that link between urban design and um active travel and mixed use land, land use or mixed use engagement with uh, the, the urban area around you is, is absolutely key. Thank you. So uh, I'm just wondering whether there are any other questions uh, from our audience, because we're at 10 to three. So we've got you know a couple of minutes left. Is there anything that anybody uh, would like to ask? Any thoughts there? Like I say, please feel free to put up your electronic hand or stick a question in the in the chat box. Just having a scan around. And also, I think Robert's already um, put the link in, hasn't he? But there is a website that um, there is a GCHU website that uh, that you can visit if you'd like to find out more um, about about the centre. Um, and perhaps David, I can, oh, I see, sorry, somebody's just put their hand up. Ken, Ken, you've put your you. electronic, you've put your electronic hand up just in the nick of time. What's your question, <laughs> Ken? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, look, I'm just interested in um, collaboration. Uh, you, you mentioned about uh, outside the UK, um, I'm calling from Melbourne. And, um, and we've, we've, had some uh, ac activities uh, on healthy cities, uh, particularly connected with WHO over the years. And 
I'm just wondering um, about uh, collaboration with um, with other areas like us uh, in in this. Uh, what would be the uh, would there be particular areas or particular aspects that you're interested in collaborating with um, with with places outside the UK? How would that work? Panel, who who can who can jump in to answer Ken's I'm, question? I'm happy to leap in, and then maybe um, maybe colleagues would like to say their their experience. I mean, we all have our, uh, our research that in various uh, regions around the world. So individually, we have our research interests. Um, the research interests that we're bringing together are, well, first of all, the working with the Commission uh, on Creating Healthy Cities, they have an inter international advisory panel. And so we're, we're receiving uh, evidence and uh, opinion from around the world. And the call for evidence is, is one aspect that, um, that Juliet's looking at in terms of where people are sending in um, stuff studies or suggestions for future research. I think one of the key aspects of uh, as we're sort of, you know, stepping forward um, now that we actually can do uh, on the ground of your research is to look at the uh, I know, again, our colleagues are looking at links with other universities and other sort of uh, practical uh, professional associations uh, across Europe and in, in North America. So I think we are, we're lucky in that we are a newly formed uh, research centre. We've actually been running sort of public seminars uh, for over four or five years now in, in various guises. And now we have our research fellows and a, and a commitment to building up wider partnership so really it, it, we're really open to all aspects of research uh, collaboration that links together this broad idea of healthy cities um i know that might seem a bit too broad but um you know that's sort of our, our focus and aim to to move forward with it i know we've been talking about which research grants and which what collaborations we're we're, we're hoping to build and are building uh, currently thank you david and um ken does that answer your question uh yeah, look, I think it does in a general way. Look, if, if there's time just to comment briefly on a cycle um, paths, which is a bit of a bugbear for me, that people talk a lot about cycling, and uh, I think it's a bit more established in the UK and Europe, and but it's it's taking off here. It's take it's gone uh, higher and higher over the last uh, couple of decades here, and especially during COVID, of course. But um, but we we have only just a few good bike paths and they're mostly shared with pedestrians and uh, there's they're really uh, I feel that they're really not catered for and yet it's such a healthy and sustainable form of transport. Well I think active travel is a key aspect of designing healthy cities and um, uh, one of our public seminars which Juliet mentioned we're looking at uh, using Oxford as a case study and how we have um, certain roads more more open to shared uh, use of from cycles uh, wheeling and walking. So I would tune in to the public seminar, which Juliet remind me the date. I think it's the 13th of October. It will will be recorded, but that's one aspect we'll be discussing the importance of this sort of active travel, which obviously includes cycling within urban neighborhoods and the wider city network. Thank you. And actually, um, thank you, Ken. And one of the questions is, will the twice termly public cinema seminars at Kellogg be recorded and available electronically? Yes, they'll be uploaded to the website with sort of transcripts and subtitles and things super. Uh, pretty soon after the event. So stay tuned to the website for those. OK, super. Thank you, Robert. Now, I think there um, was I saw another electronic hand. Is it Ewan? Um, Ewan, we have just a couple of minutes left. So may I I'll invite you? <laughs> That's super. Thank you, Ewan. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, um, apologies. I missed the beginning. I'll go back and listening to the recording. But um, It'd be good to get your thoughts on the way that active transport is moving um, towards more electronically assisted active transport. Um, you know, there's various cases to be made for it in terms of helping um, older people, perhaps, um, rather than uh, conventional cycling. But are you worried that, you know, these electric scooters or, or whatever it might be um, are at a risk of overtaking actual kind of fully human power transport as the healthy transport option in, in cities. Panel. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry, go on, David. Yeah, Carl, no, you, you, over to you, over to you. Well, I, I think you makes a very good point. And, and I guess this is why we've combined sustainable 
urban development with evidence-based approaches in healthcare. Because the key is when you intervene, what type of outcomes would you be interested in knowing whether it makes a difference or not across the population of that city? And you're talking about a numerous outcomes which can be short term, like I can get to my journey quicker because I've got access to a scooter versus medium to long term. What's the impact on health and well-being compared to real harms potentially? And, and, and it's quite interesting. Cycling came up. Well, the health benefits of cycling are, 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 are significant, but there are also harms that come with cycling because you increase your risk of a serious accident and, and breaking your, your leg and so forth. So I think they're balanced. Now, the key is, as we've moved this forward, nobody's actually put together a, a, the metrics in a consistent way that's usable in multiple dimensions to say, how do we evaluate across the board, for instance, active transport? How does that impact on wider society and how should we go about measuring that in a cost effective way, which is what we do in healthcare all the time, as opposed to in design sometimes you go, this is what I would like to see and then let's roll it out there. David. Yeah, I, I think um, obviously active travel is a, a key aspect of thinking about how we um, design cities, how we retrofit cities and, you know, how people, cities move, you know, they're, they're, they're not static and especially the residents aren't static. So um, one of the things about electric travel is the, the source of electricity, which is probably an obvious statement. Um, and I think one of the things we'd be interested in as a centre is that is looking at the evidence. I mean, how many people who are on the e-scooter have decided, well, well rather than cycle, we'll, we'll go on an e-scooter or electric bike. I think there's a lot um, to uh, be be looked at, and I think we all have opinions about various forms of electric transport within within a city, whether it's e-scooters, e-bikes, etc. But I think the uptake in e-bikes, uh, I think last year there were more electronic bikes sold in the UK, well, probably not last year, that's a, probably a bad choice, but before the pandemic, the number of electric electronic bikes sold was higher than, um, should we say, non-power assisted bikes. So I think how that again maps out when, uh, in terms of uh, pe changing people's um, lifestyle, whether it's commuting or, or leisure time, it would be a really interesting aspect to look into. Um, and again, it's uh, particularly the post-pandemic. Uh, one of my interests at, at the start of the pandemic, whichever city you're in, was a notion of, gosh, we've got this utopia now when, you know, people uh, are not on the roads and, you know, go down to fewer cars, etc. And there was many articles, again, op-eds and newspapers and anecdotal arguments, well, maybe there's be a sea change, if you will, or a road change in how we uh, travel around cities. But uh, if those of you based in a UK city or in probably many cities, that seems to be as the pandemic, uh, in some ways, the lockdown um, restrictions have, have eased in certain cities, so has the traffic return. So it's quite interesting how much the impact uh, of um, changing forms of road transport will have. Um, and in terms of increasing car ownership and new cities, people don't want to go on public transport uh, and how much how much of that will actually be transported, if you will, to the use of e-scooters and e-bikes is something that really needs uh, some evidence based research to, to to look at closely. David, thank you. Um, I'm, I think um, we are literally two minutes at uh, two minutes to three. So I think um, I am going to say thank you. Um, so much to our panel for this fascinating presentation and subsequent discussion. And then equally, thank you so much to our audience for making it such an interesting uh, discussion. Robert has uh, put some links in the chat there for you um, to the uh, centre's website. And I do hope that some of you will choose to click on there and have a look and perhaps join us for the seminars. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you once again for joining us. Panel, thank you so much uh, for that fantastic presentation. And I will wish you all a lovely rest of day. Thank you very much. <laughs>